in terms of the fir first person that's coming up, he's going to give a, he's going to be sort of a concert demonstration of traditional music. Now, I didn't meet Fred personally until maybe seven or eight years ago, but I feel like I've known him all my life. And I think a lot of people have that feeling because when I first started playing the guitar, and I went out and looked for a book on uh, how to play the guitar, it didn't take long to find a book by Fred Sokolo. He has about, I think he mentioned to be about 150 books and videos currently on the market. Not only for guitar, for banjo, uh, mandolin, and the, greatest, the latest craze, ukulele. He's a, 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 he's a recording artist, he's a great performer, and so without any more further ado, uh, and this is going to, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground in a half hour, so pay close attention and give a nice warm welcome to Fred Sokolo. instruments in bluegrass and where it comes from and stuff like that and and uh, I thought I would I, I can demonstrate most of the instruments not fiddle but the other ones uh, so I'm gonna do that and just play a little bit and talk a bunch I like to tell stories so that works out okay um, you know a friend of mine Jody Stecker had a band that had all the bluegrass instruments in it plus a sitar an Indian guy who played sitar wonderfully and when we and we did a little tour and when we uh, we would always start with a real fast fiddle tune. And when Krishna would play his solo on the fiddle tune, people would just get totally knocked out to hear a sitar playing that stuff. And uh, after, after some applause for the tune, Jody would tell people, he would say a lot of people are really surprised to see an Indian sitar playing in a bluegrass band with the Spanish guitar and the African banjo and the Italian mandolin and the German violin and the Hawaiian dobro. And I'm not sure where the bass comes from, probably Germany or Austria or something like that. So it is a mix of, of international instruments, um, you know, from all over the place. So I want to start just by talking about a little bit about how the different instruments work together. So, and that's why Lynn is up here, because she plays bass. And uh, come on closer here, where I can see you. So, you know, the bass mostly just plays, if, if, if there's a song going like that, the bass plays on two and four, I mean, one and one, what is it, one and three, like that, one, three, one, two, three, four, on the downbeats like that, we do a little bit of that. So she's doing that, if it's a, if it's a little bit funkier beat, she can walk, like, Faster beat, she can slap, which bluegrass players like to do. So, and of course, the guitar is playing the, the downbeats and the offbeats, doing that while she's doing it. Um, now, when I was a kid and I went to see some of the classic bluegrass bands like Flat and Scruggs and the Stanley Brothers and Bill Monroe and these guys, uh, most of the guitar players, all they did was play rhythm. And you know, uh, fancy. Bluegrass guitar players nowadays play with a flat pick and play really fast stuff. But uh, Lester Flat and Carter Stanley, those guys played with a thumb pick and finger picks. And all they would do was keep the time, make the rhythm sound good, do a little bass run every once in a while, and, uh, and the famous G run that kind of punctuates the end of a sentence like that. But then, uh, beginning of the 60s, both Doc Watson and Clarence White started doing really fancy fiddle tunes uh, and, and playing solos, and they elevated the, uh, the role of the guitar to be a lead in a soloing instrument, just like the banjo or the, or the fiddle or whatever. So, uh, so in the past, like when Mabel Carter played a solo on a guitar, she would go like... Play. 
I was a teenager, I'd go to the Ashgrove to see all the great uh, Americana uh, musicians, and they, there was a there was a open mic night that was hosted by a group called the Kentucky Colonels, and their guitar player was a 15 year old kid named Clarence White. He was doing stuff. We're talking 1962 here. He was doing stuff like what Doc Watson was doing, but with his own flavor. And this guy, he would stand there without cracking a smile. This 15 year old kid. And he'd be playing these incredible licks, and all the guitar players in the audience just that their jaws would drop because it was a brand new thing for guitar players to do that in bluegrass. Um, so anyway, enough about that. So uh, now in bluegrass, you'll hear real fancy uh, guitar guitar soloing, just like any other instrument. So um, I guess you could be excused now if you like. <laughs> Miss her already. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about the mandolin now. You know, Bill Monroe played the mandolin, and he's pretty much universally regarded as the father of bluegrass music. He was in a musical family, and he was the youngest, and all the other instruments were taken, so he got stuck with the mandolin. But it worked out well for him. Um, so, you know, the mandolin is tuned just like a fiddle. So uh, fiddle tunes come real naturally to this instrument. And it pretty much does the same thing in a bluegrass band that a fiddle does. Um, you know, you can play fiddle tunes, uh, you know. Here's Sally Good, probably 150 years old. That's what a mandolin sounds like playing a, a fiddle tune, but of course they also do uh, these rhythm chops on the offbeats. So, oh, meet me tonight, love, oh, meet me. So that's sort of the opposite of what the bass is doing. The bass is going, dum, 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 man was dum, 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 like that. And it really, you know, pushes the beat. And when they're, and the other thing, the mandolin, of course, is really famous for, because it comes from Italy, and it's got this, beautiful tremolo thing that it does. So Bill Monroe had one of his first big hits was his song Blue Moon in Kentucky. And that's when that's when you can use some of that some of that tremolo in a ballad type of tune like that. And it's really pretty that way. Now Bill Monroe organized um, the, the instruments in, in a different way than other stringed instruments. There were string bands all over the South with banjo and fiddle and mandolin and guitar and so on. But what was different about him was that he, or, he organized things differently. He, uh, he, he had everybody, instead of everybody just sort of playing together all at the same time, uh, you know, usually in the old time string bands, somebody would sing a verse and, and then everybody would all play the solo all together, but he had, different instruments come to the mic, come to the center and be highlighted. So he'd sing a verse and while everybody's playing, Phil would come up to the microphone and just play a solo. And then on the next verse, the banjo might come up. So when you spotlight the instruments like that, you gotta have virtuoso players and that's what he had. Uh, he called himself Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys because he was from the Bluegrass region of Kentucky. And bands tended to do that back then. It was uh, so-and-so in the Carolina, you know, whatever. The region they were from was part of their name. And uh, in, by 1945 and 46, he was playing regularly at the Grand Ole Opry. And when, but when bluegrass really came together and started being called the bluegrass music, was in about 47 when Earl Scruggs joined the band. So um, let's, let's switch over to, uh, but before we get to that story, This instrument, some people call it a Hawaiian guitar, right? Yeah, it's got that metal resonator in the middle. It just makes it good and loud. And it's played with a steel bar, of course. The first uh, time that we heard dobro in country music was in the late 20s when Jimmy Rogers started recording. And there was a Hawaiian guy that played dobro with him on some recordings. And I believe first time it was played in bluegrass music was Flat and Scruggs Band 
in the early 50s. And that's who I really learned how to play dobra from, was this guy, Uncle Josh, Buck Graves, who was uh, the Flat and Scruggs player. Now, Earl Scruggs had this rolling style, you know, of, of, of uh, finger picking, and Josh picked up on it and did the same thing. <laughs> Or what Earl was doing, but what I really, what really knocked me about him, uh, knocked me out about him, was when he did the really pretty stuff on the dobro. Uh, here's here's an example of some of the type of things. So, so. For fast tunes and slow tunes, you know, Dovro's great for bluegrass, and of course it's used in country music as well. But uh, let's talk about the banjo a little bit. Okay, so... So, in 1947, Bill Monroe had a banjo player called uh, Dave Aikman, but his stage name was Stringbean, because he was real tall, and thin like string bean, and he was sort of a comedian. He wore his pants down around his knees in the hip hop style that's often, often seen today. And, and most of the banjo players in those days in string bands were comedians. Grandpa Jones, you know, had a handlebar mustache and grandpa glasses when he was uh, in his 20s. It was a shtick. And, and uh, Uncle Dave Macon, he swung the banjo around while he was playing it and did a lot of com comedy. <coughs> Sorry. So. That was the deal, and uh, mostly either they did frailing and claw hammer stuff that sounded, that sounded kind of like that, or they did two finger picking. That's what Dave Aikman did. So he might, if he backed up Bill Monroe to play in uh, Footprints in the Snow, for example, he goes some folks like this summertime when they can stroll about. Strolling through the meadow green is a pleasure, there's no doubt. So he'd be doing this kind of a two finger picking. personal reasons, uh, Lester Flatt was in Monroe's band and he said, we don't need another banjo player, it's, we don't really need it for our sound. But he auditioned Earl Scruggs and uh, Earl had this real fresh, real fast rolling technique, three finger technique that just knocked you out. Lester heard him and said to Bill, pay him whatever he wants. <laughs> so uh, Bill, as I mentioned, he, already been, he had already been playing at the Opry every weekend for years, but the, when in 1947 when he introduced Earl, the, the band with Earl in it, that's when bluegrass really came together. And uh, they did some real fast tune called Molly and Tenbro, it's about a racehorse, two racehorses. And Earl had a solo. solo over and over and over again because he never heard anything like it. And uh, Uncle Dave and uh, Grandpa Jones came out to the wings, you know, to see what all the fuss was about and they watched him for a while. And uh, Earl's just standing there with a straight face doing all this knockdown stuff. And Uncle Dave says to Grandpa Jones, he says, he ain't one damn bit funny. <laughs> and that was another thing about Bill Monroe, by the way, no comedy. 
and everybody was, in, instead of, you know, the, a lot of the bands sort of played the hillbilly card and wore overalls and stuff like that. He had the guys dressed in three-piece suits, everything matching, you know, cowboy hats and masks and ties and the whole bit. Very dignified. A lot of times he wouldn't crack a smile. Maybe in his late 80s he started smiling a little bit. <laughs> so, so um, almost overnight, other string bands started incorporating banjo players that sounded that could do something like what Earl was doing, and uh, people started calling it bluegrass music because Bill Monroe's band was Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. At first, Bill was kind of pissed off. He felt like somebody was they were stealing something from him. <clears throat> but um, he came to realize after a while that he was being credited as the grandfather of this whole new genre, and uh, and it was kind of uh, obviously a really amazing thing. Um, so now. I, since I got a banjo here, I want to talk a little bit about Bill Keith. Uh, Bill was one of the most uh, important banjo players of, of the bluegrass era. He just passed away a couple days ago, and it's been a hard couple of years where banjo players, Earl Scruggs and Doug Diller, both died really back to back. And, and uh, Earl is every banjo player that plays bluegrass learned by imitating Earl to begin with. And then there's other people that are important too in, in banjo, but he's the guy. He's undisputedly the guy. And about 1961 or so, or two, Bill Keith kind of came into the spotlight because he had figured out a three finger style. He was real good at playing Scrug style, but he had figured out a way to play some stuff that was really hard to play with Scrug style. You know, if a, if a tune was real noty and went up and down a lot, uh, there were certain links that you just couldn't get with the Scruggs style, and he figured out a way to get them on the banjo. So he really pushed the envelope, and, and before long, all the bluegrass banjo players were incorporating Keith style into their Scruggs style. I had already woodshedded on what Scruggs did, and I heard Bill, I went to the Ash Grove and saw him playing with Bill Monroe. Bill hired him because he always wanted to push the envelope. And he said, I've got, he says, I think I've got the best banjo player in the business right now, and uh, he plays fiddle tunes the right way on the banjo. And he called him Brad Keith, which was his middle name was Bradford, because he didn't want to have two bills in the band. He thought that was confusing. And here's what, here's what he did. He figured out a way to play these scales and things. One of the tunes he arranged for banjo was Devil's Dream, when a real old fiddle tune came from the British Isles, like so many of them. Fleischer cartoons, Turkey in the Straw, and all these kind of tunes, because they're in the public domain, nobody has to pay for them. They used to put them on ice cream trucks. Now they're on video games. So, um, Bill did another thing. Oh, by the way, that style, so as I mentioned, all the bluegrass banjo players started incorporating that into their style, and uh, not just for fiddle tunes, but for all kinds of tunes. And, and uh, now we've got, like, uh, Bela Fleck using a combination of Scruggs style and Keith style to play, you know, Paganini violin solos. And I worked out, I worked out part of a, I worked out one of Bach inventions that way. I don't know if I can only remember a little bit of it. Uh, 
with, with this idea. He, uh, again, improved on something that Earl had done. Earl had certain tunes where he tuned, detuned the banjo in the middle of a song for a special effect. <laughs> tunes, and, and in several other tunes he used the tuners, he, he took a clock apart and used clockworks and made this complicated thing that bent the strings and you, you had to drill holes in your banjo and put two other pegs in there and it was kind of a mess, but it sounded really cool. And, uh, and they weren't perfect. In his version of Earl's Breakdown that they recorded, you could hear where one time he does the tuner thing and it doesn't come back to the right place. And he, and he stays off the second string for the rest of the solo and then gets it together. So. Um, so what Bill Keith did was he figured out a way to make Scruggs tuners incorporated into the regular banjo tuners so that you didn't have to uh, drill more holes in your banjo and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, but I've taken it a step further now. I have digital uh, Keith tuners. And by digital, I mean I use my fingers. <laughs> I'll show you an example. think of it as being music that the roots of it do go back way farther than 1947 that's for sure they're playing they're playing uh, old fiddle tunes that some of them are 200 years old but but there's all kinds of new elements in bluegrass now and you know the music keeps growing uh, but um, like I said Bill Monroe's kind of the start of it and uh, when he passed away sometime in the 90s it, it occurred to me now the people that love this kind of music can young people coming up will never be able to see the guy that started it all. But there's great bands out there, and some of them are pushing the envelope and doing new kinds of stuff, and others are keeping the traditional bluegrass, bluegrass alive. So that's my story. I got a few minutes left here, and I wonder if I could get my wife back up here to sing one last song with me just before we're, we're done. Are you out there? Yeah. There, there you go. All right, so Lynn, Lynn so. songwriter and she writes lyrics and uh, sometimes I write music to her lyrics and this is one of our tunes that we collaborated on. Listen, this is a song about aging. Is there anybody that can relate to that in the audience? No, no probably not. Okay, let's see, let me get this more comfortable. Okay, it's called I'd Rather Be Over Than Under the Hill. <laughs> and uh, playing a little bluegrassy guitar here. Do I? 
I see Who's that old geezer staring at me I don't remember growing this old It just seemed to happen all on its own And those pretty young girls They just pass me right by I can't button these old jeans As hard as I try I could despair and bemoan my sad fate But as long as I'm breathing It's never too late Cause I'd rather be over Than under the hill A wrinkle or two Well, it ain't no big deal I know I may look like I've been through the mill But I'd rather be over Than under the hill chin multiplies and I might need a porter for these bags beneath my eyes but no matter how I look I think that I should in five years I wish that I still look this good the story of my life is written on my face I wouldn't change a thing Sissies, it's true and it's sad, but consider the options that don't look half bad. They can sing this chorus with me. I'd rather be over than under a wrinkle or two. A wrinkle or two, well, it ain't no big deal. I know I may look, no, I may look like I've been through the mill, but I. Bye.